Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I'm so excited to be here, and thank you to PyCon for having me. Um, so I wanted to make sure I got a little bit of Python in there. <laughs> um, so this is learnings from classical industrial design for digital world. Um, so bear with me if I sound a little bit like this guy today. I have a pretty nasty cold. Um, so originally this slide was titled, Who Am I? But that felt a bit too existentialist. So <laughs> uh, I'm a designer. Um, I work at a usability consultancy in Toronto called Usability Matters. My education is in industrial design. Um, I studied at what I like to call the Irish OCAD, NCAD, our National College of Art and Design. So I'm really interested in people, systems, and interactions, which makes UX design a pretty ideal fit. I think technology is at a really interesting point where we're just at the beginning of developing really robust and humane digital technologies. So the idea for this talk came from thinking about what it was like to transition from designing physical 3D products to digital ones that often live on 2D screens. Design is basically a process. It's a way of solving problems, so you can kind of apply it to anything. Um, however, I think there are some perspectives and ideas I really took with me from my ID training and work into the digital world. Um, these are not exclusive to industrial design, but today I'm going to talk about them in the ID context and look at how this has been or can be applied to working in digital. I'm going to use examples of classic design icons to illustrate the talk. I hope maybe you recognize some of them. Um, I'm going to talk about six principles over the next 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for some Q&A. So to start us off, uh, this is the Eames lounge chair in Ottoman. It might be familiar. Fraser has one in his apartment. <laughs> It was released in 1956, and it is part of the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was designed by Charles and Ray Eames, whose marriage and creative partnership has been described as a modernist fairy tale of true partnership. So what I wanted to talk about here is partnership is powerful. Here they are sitting together in their chair in Ottoman. Charles and Ray are one of the most celebrated couples in creative history. Their work together was remarkably prolific, spanning everything from architecture and furniture to fine art and film. Partnership and the p power of collaboration is, of course, something which is relevant to all professions and walks of life. There are loads of examples in the digital world. Here is Bill Gates and Paul Allen in 1968. I like this photo. Uh, there are plenty of these star partnerships in the tech world. Um, Google founders Brennan Page, of course, come to mind. I think the lesson or approach here is that we're better together, and most truly awesome things are not the effort of a singular person. Uh, collaboration is key now more than ever. I think about this every time I launch Photoshop, and I marvel, marvel at the long list of names that it takes to build amazing software. It's a team effort. Design has long suffered from star designer syndrome, where one person gets all the glory, when in reality, almost all design is co-produced and created. You will even notice in this talk, I'm guilty of attributing things to one designer. Um, so I guess it's like celebrate your teammates and it takes a village. Um, of course, it's not news to you. Open source is a beautiful example of this principle in practice. So this is a Polaroid 1000 instant camera from the late 70s. Edwin Land was a pioneer of instant photography, which gained in popularity in the 50s and 60s and exploded in the 70s. At its peak popularity, people were shooting one billion Polaroids per, per year, which is not bad for the days before Instagram. Uh, to contrast, recent Instagram figures estimate 40 million uploads per day of photos. Um, so the story goes that the idea for instant photography came from Land's daughter asking, why can't I see it now when, uh, when he took photos? So what I wanted to talk about here was focusing on needs. Edwin Land saw a gap for making photography accessible, instant and hassle-free, used in an everyday way like the telephone. He set about building for that need. He was also really good at pitching these ideas and ran shareholder meetings at Polaroid like a showcase. So Steve Jobs has talked about how he idolized Land and explicitly said he built Apple on the Polaroid model, mixing cutting-edge tech with beauty and design to fulfill user needs. How does this apply to digital? Uh, this is from the gov.uk redesign in the UK, which recently won a Design of the Year award. Uh, they have a set of principles, the first of which is start with needs. It's about identifying and thinking about real user needs and focusing on understanding these needs thoroughly. 
This shift is really exciting as we see institutions and businesses uh, realize that designing for what real people need rather than forcing business structures on users can be exciting and profitable. So when we're building anything, we can ask, what need does this serve? A designer called Dieter Rams worked at Braun from 1955, and he became their chief design officer in 1961. The image is of his SK4 record player. He created electronics for the home, such as alarm clocks, record players, and slide projectors. He is considered one of the most influential designers of the 20th century. The objects he created were user-friendly and restrained in their aesthetic. So the lesson here is what Rams once summed up his design approach as, less but better. One of his principles of good design is that good design is as little design as possible. His thinking was that good design focuses on the essential aspects, and therefore products are not burdened with non-essentials. This also relates to focusing on needs. So I think there is huge scope for us to think about this when designing and building digital products, and I guess less but better could probably also apply to code. I think Facebook is an example that comes to mind for me um, of feature bloat, more but worse, as it were. <laughs> this is just, uh, there's so much going on that it becomes overwhelming and not very user-friendly. I think we can see some of this less but better thinking in minimum viable product, but I would propose that perhaps we can think about minimum valuable product. What's the essence of what we're trying to build and how can we scale it back to its core value to people? Do one thing well that provides value and you're off. <laughs> so how can we incorporate less but better in software? I think this is a good example from project management platform Trello. Uh, they recently introduced power-ups, which are optional new features. Uh, the idea here was to retain the core valuable product experience, not to add clutter, but to make extra features and functionality available to power users. Um, so you, you sort of decide whether you want to turn these on or not. They're not automatically launched. Um, so I think this is a great way of incorporating less but better for a new feature launch. So this brings us to the DC01, um, the first model Dyson vacuum cleaner. James Dyson is a remarkable man and a real inventor engineer type of designer. A disassembled wall-mounted Dyson decorates the staff lounge at the Royal College of Art in London. James Dyson takes a real problem-solving approach to his work. He sees a problem, like dust clogging a Hoover filter, and resolves to come up with a better way. It's not always easy, though. It took him five years and 5,127 prototypes to get to the DC01. So here we're talking about iteration. Um, as many times as it takes. There's lots of valuable lessons here. One of the things about transitioning to digital that I found really exciting was the short iteration cycles. In industrial design, it can take years to get to market, uh, but building websites or apps, I could prototype really quickly, and projects could get to market in super short cycles. This is great, but I think the downside is sometimes we, or definitely I, forget that it can take a lot of time and perseverance to build something really awesome. Of course, um, lots of agile methodology works on these principles of iterating, and we're seeing this approach being taken now, even with big enterprise companies. Uh, this is the TELUS beta of their new site, which was launched after only four months. Uh, it's responsive. And it's now running a live beta, which lets them elicit feedback from the public and then iterate again. Updates are live almost every week. So I think it's a pretty inspiring example of agility and iteration in a really big enterprise company. So this is an MR10 chair designed in 1927 by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. I think it's amazing it was created in 1927. It looks really modern to me, like even now. Um, Mies van der Rohe is experimenting with precision tubular steel, which he bent cold to retain its elastic property. So the semicircular curves of the front legs enhance the effect. They were the optimal shape to support the springy function of the tubing. Which brings us to this lesson of uh, truth to materials. So this is a tenet of modernism, which says that materials should be used where they are most appropriate and their nature should not be hidden. So if you're using concrete, the thinking being that you shouldn't paint it and you should celebrate its means of construction. For example, leave the marks that were left behind from the way it was created. So this chair kind of embodies it in that the form and material of the chair are interdependent. So we're at a really interesting point in interface design where we're talking about authenticity and how to be authentically digital, 
which can be seen as a riff on truth to materials. Most of this is currently playing out in the discussion of skeuomorphic versus flat design. Um, so I like this example from Sasha Grief. He asks, which of these calculators um, is skeuomorphic in design? The answer being that they're both, in fact, skeuomorphic, as they both imitate the layout of a physical calculator. So they're still taking cues from the real world and the physical object. With Windows 8 Metro design style and iOS 7, we're moving away from realism and interface design. I think apps like Clear show us what happens when you strip away realism and let in information and gestural controls take center stage. One of the risks, though, is that we do away with affordances, i.e. it becomes difficult for people to identify what is an interactive element. So uh, thinking about how we can incorporate truth to materials as we move forward with digital is one of my favorite challenges, but I think there's lots to do and lots to figure out. So this is one of my favorite pieces of industrial design ever. It's an Alvetti Laterra 32 typewriter designed by Marco Nazzoli in 1963. This is also an example of how materials influence design. He took an innovation from the auto industry, press forming steel, and applied it to typewriters. This is the model that Cormac McCarthy wrote on, so books like The Road, up until he auctioned his original machine in 2009 and brought a, bought a replacement model um, in newer condition. So the principle here is build for longevity. I have one of these machines and it works perfectly. It's a really wonderful piece of engineering. McCarthy used his machine for 46 years and said it was never serviced or cleaned, except for blowing the dust out of it with a service station hose. So most Alvetti typewriters have a longer lifespan than today's computers. I think this is one of the most challenging ones to integrate in the digital world. We feel like the pace of things has changed, that it would somehow be unreasonable to expect the things we build to be around and still functioning in 50 years' time. I'm not sure how we go about integrating this idea. I guess concepts like backwards compatibility are a start, so any thoughts or suggestions you have, I'd love to hear them. So just to recap, uh, these are some of the principles I've brought with me from my industrial design training and work. The reason I think this type of reflection can be valuable is that we have a rich history of creation, and it can be good to take stock of what methods and learnings are appropriate to bring forward as we continue to develop and build new digital technologies. So that brings us to the end for today. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting and maybe provided some food for thought. If you'd like to uh, talk about anything, feel free to get in touch. I'd love to hear your ideas, what resonated, what didn't. Um, thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks a lot. And I can bring the microphone to you for questions, or you can come to that one. So it seems like a lot of your industrial design that you, or and it seems like a lot of designers seem to really be into is stuff mainly from like the 70s, mid 70s and before. Is it like just a bias or did design just die in the 80s? Yeah. Like, like physical design just die in the 80s? It's kind of funny. Like I think one of, um, one of the things that I think about, like one of the reasons I'm not an industrial designer is like I think we've made all the good chairs. Like <laughs> I think we're done, you know? Um, I think, uh, I don't know. I guess it was a really interesting time when, you know, the industrial revolution and mass production meant that we were producing interesting objects. Um, I guess modernism and sort of Bauhaus were seen as the peak of that type of classical industrial design. Um, I don't really know. Maybe we're just too close to the sort of 80s to be able to, you know, appreciate what it brought. But I mean, some of the 80s movements like Memphis, which is a really like ugly Italian kind of gaudy style, like I don't like, because um, I think it got really consumerist and extreme at that stage. Yeah, so I'm not sure. So could it just be like these things just need time? Like stuff from the 50s, like it's, it's okay. It's still kind of gross looking, but it's starting to like get nice. Like could it be like old Gothic design was really gross and then it became nice like around like uh, maybe 100 years later or something like yeah, that. I could mean, it just be time that makes the stuff look good again? For sure. I mean, I think some things take time um, to appreciate, but I also do think there's something in that like at that time, designers were working to find like the one true form for an object, and I think some of those classics are going to stick around for a long time. You look at a lot of sci-fi, and they're still using like Barcelona chairs and you know lots of the kind of 50s, 60s 
design still looks really futuristic to us and is kind of everywhere. So yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see with time. Thanks. Um, do you think that, like the point that you brought up with the iPhone uh, lasting 50 years, there tends to be a refresh of the hardware really often. And so do you think that that high rate of iteration is at odds with longevity and products? Or do you think that they have a path that they can merge together? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a really challenging one, right? Like, I mean, I, I personally don't think the rate that we're making new hardware is sustainable. Like, you know, it, like device fragmentation too makes like my job a lot harder. <laughs> so maybe it's selfish. But you know, the sort of idea that like something new is getting spit out of the rectangle factory, like all the time, um, you know, <laughs> even just from a like a material perspective, it's not sustainable. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see sort of devices being built for longevity. And then maybe it's like we can work to um, iterate like software or, but I mean, I'm not really sure. Like I said, it's super challenging. I mean, most of the things I make aren't going to be around in 50 years, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, as a brief follow up to that, even though you just said that things you make aren't necessarily going to be around, if we're looking to make things that are going to be really lasting, um, do you have any idea of what a reasonable time frame would be nice for people to shoot for, especially with software where yeah. like, maintenance is one of the hardest things mm -hmm. in software? But we would love it to last a really long time. And sometimes, like in banks, it does last a really long time. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I think things will probably reach an equilibrium, you know? Because like, right now, I think there's an explosion of the things we're like, building and making. And the, also the kinds of needs we're serving, right? Like, we're going to reach a point where we're, I think, where we're sort of serving most of the basic needs we have. And maybe it'll sort of level out. As for a time frame, I mean, I don't know. I'd love if. The things I work on are around in like five years, you know, <laughs> web like websites. I mean, I mainly work like web and mobile. So, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, so great lessons that that you shared. But I'm curious, and and well, I know this can be a talk in itself. But maybe some of the how you approach it in your process to incorporate these lessons in each mm -hmm. one of the projects that you take on. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, like, um, I guess if we go back to, oh or not. <laughs> um, I was just going to look at the summary, but like uh, things like focusing on needs, so sort of having, like speaking to, you know, real users, but actually talking to people at the start of a process and actually finding out what people's needs and desires are, as well as sort of combining that with, um, you know, looking at analytics, like where are people spending their time, say, on a website or whatever, um, to really think about like how you can serve real user needs, I mean, that's something. Um, sort of working collaboratively, I mean, I think, I'm sure that's something everyone experiences, but whenever I have a problem or get sort of hit a sticky point, like just grabbing someone and saying like, hey, can I borrow your brain for five minutes? Even if it's like something that I'm assigned to as sort of a standalone. Um, yeah, and I mean, iteration, like for me and what I do, it's often things like paper prototyping and then sort of guerrilla user testing, like grabbing some poor person in the corridor and being like, what do you think this does? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sort of doing that, doing that repeatedly, like, uh, yeah. Like, I think truth to materials I really struggle with, and like that's sort of the reason I'm trying to, you know, like I dabble in like HTML, CSS, and I'm trying to sort of wrap my head around actual code. So that was really weird for me because I came from somewhere where like I understood the physical world and what it was made of. And now I was suddenly designing for something that I really didn't have any idea how to build for. And to me, that felt really kind of wrong. Um, so trying to educate myself about how these things are actually made and trying to talk to developers about like, what's it like to actually build this thing? And hopefully getting to a point, I mean, you know, I can do sort of basic prototyping for web, but hopefully getting to a point where I can actually understand the materials more deeply. Yeah. Cool, You're welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes, that's all the questions we have time for. Let's thank her again, Lynn. <laughs>